It's time now for Ask the Surgeon, brought to you by Everett Bone and Joint. Everett Bone and Joint, the best choice to get you back in the game. Learn more at everettboneandjoint.com. All right, Dr. Jeff Mason decided to stick around and uh, sit through this segment with us. We have, I have a shoulder impingement, rotator cuff tendon I just want to talk about, but I have questions that uh, they don't let me ask in different places, but here I am. I'm going to ask you anyway. What's, what's your favorite, uh, you know, I used to be... Okay. Color? Okay. No, not your favorite color. Yeah. <laughs> tree. I was going to go with tree. What's your, what's your favorite surgery that you like to do? It would be hard for me to specify a single one. I am a generalist, though, so I probably, that's one of the reasons it would be hard to specify. Certain subspecialists would say, oh, I like doing, you know, anterior, posterior fusions, or I like doing total hips. I like stabilizing shoulders a lot because it's very challenging, and, and when it goes well, you sort of watch the anatomy reappear in front of your eyes, and that's very gratifying. I like anterior cruciate ligaments because... Um, you give so much back to someone's knee and you're working in small spaces and you're all, you're forever sitting there thinking about millimeters, which is for, I mean, it can, I guess it could be thought of as being a little bit stressful, but more you sort of enjoy saying, okay, where do I exactly want this graph to go? And if you look at the distances you're fretting over, they're quite literally two millimeters, you know, millimeter and a half. And so I think those are my favorite operations. Yeah, and the profession, orthopedics, that is, has really changed quite a bit. You just described yourself as a generalist. That means you've done it all. You've yeah. seen it all, and we'll probably see it all again in your lifetime. But the world now is fellowship, fellowship, specialization, and a lot of practices are going to where guys are coming out with spines. And tell us what's going on there. Well, we've done that in our practice where everyone we've hired for quite a number of years has been a subspecialist. Are there any orthopedists coming out and just general orthopedists anymore? It's well under 10%. So, so the fellowship is almost a must for these young surgeons. Yeah, and and part of it is they change the rules for for hours during residency training, and nobody works anything like the hours that me and my older colleagues worked when we were in training. It's against the law now. And so now when people are done with their residencies, they, people say, well, I haven't seen, I've only done so many of these. I haven't done enough of this. I haven't done enough of that. And when we were saying, I, I've done enough of everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so you want to pick an older doctor then than a young kid, right? Well, it depends. <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, I'm that's, kidding. That's, I'm no, just, no, it's a, good, yeah. it's a good question. That's a really good question. Let's hear no, what I mean, doctor. as a generalist, although one who's highly experienced, I see things on a regular basis. Well, for example... I gave up my total joint practice because we hired a subspecialist. And watching him plan and execute anyone that's not just a completely straightforward case, you really see why we recruited and hired someone like him. We have someone who does hip arthroscopies, and also watching him work with, with the scope, I watch him immediately out of training. Um, some of his skills exceed mine, and I have vast amounts of experience. So it, the training is very good, and they're doing things. I mean, he, he's doing things that when I was in training – they weren't done. Yeah, when, when you describe a fellowship like you talk about a fellowship in, in total joints, I mean, these surgeons that are doing these fellowships, they spend a whole year and they see nothing except total joints. Right. I know that uh, our um, subspecialist, Dr. Huang, when he came out, before he even started working with us, he had probably done um, more total knees than the average orthopedic surgeon does in an entire career in one year. He just worked in a center where they came from all over the country. That's what they did, and they did any number of them every single day. And, and your skill just, yeah. you know, it's just repetitive. Yeah. And, and he did many, many hips too, but even more knees than hips. And so it's sort of like you're hiring someone who's highly experienced even though they've been in training. Does it work where you're done with school, you do the residency, and then you work on the fellowship for a year? Is that how that works? Exactly. Yeah, and you know some people do even more than a year, but most people by the time they've done a fellowship, they've now done six years of training after being an MD, and they say they're ready to get out there and get to work. So the progression of your education is you do four years of medical school, you get accepted into residency, and then residency, your first year in residency as a surgeon, and you know you want to be an orthopedic surgeon. Are they putting you in general surgery? Or are you just well? What happens is after you've you know gone to gotten your undergrad degree, then you've gone to medical school, and then you start your residency, and the first year of residency is typically called an internship. And sometimes they're general surgery internships. Other times they're floating internships where you do a couple months of a few different things. But in most cases, in your first year, 
you're not doing that much orthopedics. And then your second through fifth year, it's all orthopedics. And then the fellowship is for people who say, gee, I want to do spine or I want to do hand or I want to do sports medicine and concentrate on shoulders or hips or knees or I want to do total joints or foot and ankle. And your first year in residency, you describe it as an internship. Um, you know, are you just doing history and physicals? What 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 are you learning that? Well, are you going on rounds? Is that where you like follow the big surgeon and he yells well, at you and stuff? Well, he, <laughs> and you, big surgeon. you yeah, stay up for like twenty eight hours straight and stuff. Yeah, well, how's it changed? They don't let them do that anymore. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I used to. We What's used to, wrong I with used, this world? I, know, I used to have what's called the forty hour work day. Yeah, was, that's how long you would work before you would go home. Where was this at? Where did you do the I did your residency in Philadelphia? Yeah, and it was it was grim. I mean, you just you work all the time. It right. makes you nuts. But um. Uh, and you're admitting patients. You're doing all of the the legwork, and so when you're in the operating room, they'll, you'll you'll do this or that case, the more straightforward, simple things under very close supervision. You know, you do an appendectomy. Maybe if you're lucky, you'll do hernia repairs. You'll do this and that. But a lot of times, you're just assisting. You're down in the operating room, doing lots of you know taking care of wounds. You know, cleaning things up. You know. Cleaning up abscesses, it, it's it's hard, hard Entry, work. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's your start. And, and when and, you talked about rounding with the attending, right. remember, you've already rounded. You probably rounded somewhere between 4 or 5 o'clock that morning on the patient, so you know everything. And the attending comes in and says, what's going on with Mr. Smith? And you say, well, you know, he's two days out from this operation. Since that time, this has happened, that's happened, this is what's happening next. And they'll make a comment about you know, more of this, less of that. And by the way, we think you're an idiot, even though the patient's doing well. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. I, I used to I used to attend these orthopedic rounds when I was in graduate school, and I always felt bad for these orthopedic surgeons, these young orthopedic surgeons, because these attendings or these older doctors, they took pleasure in just, like, grilling. It was like you guys were on trial. Well, you know, it's funny where it's a classic aspect of medical education, but in my experience, the most accomplished and adept surgeons I ever worked with were ones who were also a pleasure to work with. Uh, you know, I, I can think of one who I actually liked a lot who was prone to flying off the handle and had quite a temper, although he was he was so witty and so funny that even when you were subject to it, you, you almost enjoyed it. But most of the ones who were... <laughs> that was Dr. House he's uh, describing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but most of the ones who were really just the pinnacle of their profession, some of the some of the surgeons at Louisville Hand Surgery, these were the nicest men you ever worked with in your life. And these people, these people had patients from all over the world coming to see them. What was the, you know, working 40 hours in a day, like you said, what was the point of that? I mean, how does that help you? Well, part of it is it was where you'd often work in places where it was so busy that they just needed the warm bodies to do the work. Uh -huh. So even beyond any sort of indoctrination, it was the fact that there was that much work to do and someone had to do it. And, and, and the learning process, I mean, the idea behind that education was probably – Based on if you see it over and over and over, I mean, you get really good at it. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you get you, you become very accustomed to thinking on your feet. You become very accustomed to handling the normal problems that develop. When something unusual comes up, all of a sudden you say, gee, I've seen this before. Or I've seen something like this before. Um, and, and the learning curve for surgery is quite flat. It takes a long, long time to get good. And even when you're out in practice, you continue to improve a lot as the years go by. Well, yeah. and, and as a surgeon, I mean, what people need to understand, I think it's important. You just described an ACL. I mean, you're, you know, it sounds so simple in today's world because what? It's a 45 minute operation in today's world? Yeah, or a bit more, but something like that, yeah. And, 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 and 15 years ago, it was what? A two and a half, three hour operation? Maybe not 15 years ago, but yeah, you're generally correct. Yeah, some period of time ago, it would take hours. Hours. So, but I mean, and so during that 45 minute or whatever time frame it is, you're in there and you're making decisions based on function. I mean, that's what people need to understand. You need to replace and place that graft in a specific point where it basically is going to allow that knee to flex, extend, rotate as much as it can or does, and then allow that person to get back to activity. I mean, you're just not just, I mean. Yeah, that's the whole idea. And, and that's why yeah, surgeons like, <laughs> surgeon like surgery because you're subject to this stress that you're also trained and prepared to handle. And when you walk out of the operating room and things go well, you feel very gratified.
Yeah, and and so decision making process. I mean, when you're in there looking at that, because things change. I mean, uh, back when you started, I mean, I, I don't want to age and, and things like that. But were were they using MRIs for diagnostic? The ease of MRIs and things. Well, you you yes, they were using MRIs starting in the mid to late '80s. But those are diagnostic, and they don't necessarily give you a lot of information about what you're going to see when you're actually operating. It's when you get inside the you have know to make much decisions. More so, so as far as and that's that was the question I want to ask. How did it how did it work? Where you know, 15 years ago, you would cut somebody open. Now it's all done arthroscopically. Do you guys go away for like a seminar and they teach you how to do that, or do you do you have classes online, or how does that work? Where you know that all of a sudden you can do this when you didn't go to medical school and work 40 hours a day to do this. Now this is a new thing. How does that work? Well, the answer is all of the above. And what I mean by that, it, a lot of things were done arthroscopically when I was in training, but there are even many procedures that in orthopedics are very straightforward bread and butter cases today that weren't done at all or were rarely done arthroscopically when I was in training. And if you want to maintain those skills, you can go to, one, you can go to meetings, Two, you can actually go to seminars where you will work on models or actual, actual cadaver models. Surgeons who, for example, work at university centers where they always have the anatomy room down in the basement, you know, you'll talk to people who before they started doing this or that type of surgery said, I did 30 of these on cadavers before I ever did it on a person or sometimes more than 30, 50. I mean, whatever. you're just not going on YouTube. No. Yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. yeah, 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 no. <laughs> but, but That's how I made turkey in, soup in yesterday. Point of fact, there are, there are online... <laughs> Uh, services, their websites where you sign up, you get a password and all that, and you can literally go in and watch video. And, w and what you're doing then is you're watching something that you already do right. to see if you can learn a couple more percent about it. Yeah, Just, it, it kind, of, kind of jokingly there about YouTube, but what you've seen and what I've seen in medicine, particularly in today's world of information, patients are way more sophisticated. I mean, they've Googled, you know, if they right. suspect that they have a torn meniscus, they've Googled it, they've researched it, and when they get online sometimes, it's not the best information they can get because it's always the negative type stuff. Well, some like. people have an remarkable talent for going online and finding the stuff that's worthwhile <clears throat> and it's good information. Other people are just the opposite. They'll come in and they'll have, you know, they haven't read any of the good sites. They have come in and they have all this strange stuff. But, you know, most people are somewhere in between. You know, there's, it's a whole body of specified professional language out there that the average educated person would look at and say, I'm not able to wade through more than a bit of this. Yeah, and then, I mean, the decisions that you're making as a surgeon, I mean, particularly, let's just talk about the meniscus, and we've talked about red zones, white zones. I mean, you're going in there. When you get in there, you might see something on an MRI and say, okay, I'm going in looking at this. This is what. And when you get in there, maybe the tear is not what it, you saw on an MRI or it's in a different spot or a different place or there's another tear that wasn't picked up. I mean, you're thinking about that meniscus as a pad that that person needs between those bones for their lifetime, and you want to preserve as much as possible. Absolutely. You, you, you always know much more about the joint when, once you're in there than the MRI can ever tell you. And, and there are times when it's very different, indeed. And when, you, when you're doing that, I mean, and when you're training to do that as an intern or resident, there, is there a fellow that's in there with you talking to you and saying, well, I would take this, I would do this, I would take more of this? I mean, obviously, you get, you're you looking for really good training from good surgeons. Oh, yeah. You have someone who's looking over your shoulder and saying, well, you know, what do you think and why do you think that? And since you made that remark, well, you know, what are the statistics on this? And if you do this, what's the chance of this happening? And if you do that, what's the chance of that happening? And you're looking over your shoulder and say, can I, can I just operate here for a minute, yeah, please? Yeah, but yeah. that's the essence of medical training. It is, isn't it? I mean, it's like the decision process. I mean, what do they say? Uh, med medicine is like a 100,000-hour internship or something like that, or just the hours that you folks put in to learn your craft is amazing. Yeah, and you learn more every day. And yeah. because of that, like you, you off air, you were saying that you're gonna, you're going to the hospital later on. You have uh, surgery you're doing later on, right? Yes. Are you? I'm nervous just thinking about that. But that doesn't. That's just no big deal. That's just part of the part of the well, game. Well, it all right? depends on what it is. For the case I'm going to be doing, I'm not nervous in the least. But there are other cases where I would be, you know, thinking a lot more about it. If I thought it was necessary to review anatomy or you know to get more information about the patient, you know, it, it depends specifically on what's going on well and, and the point is i mean i think what you're uh kind of we're talking about here is as a surgeon i mean you're going to the hospital and i do surgery because you're on call yes and taking call as a surgeon that means you can get a call at three o'clock in the morning i mean two three in the morning you're in a deep sleep i mean we all you know we have to wake up certain times and you yeah get, you get a call and 
I mean, you're on Boom. the phone, and the, the hospital is saying, I've got this patient, we've got this patient, and you over the phone have to assess, do I go in, do I wait until tomorrow? Tell us about being on call as a surgeon. Is that just part of that 40-hour day? Well, yeah, it, it varies a lot. Um, in this town, we have, we've developed a system where that happens less frequently, and but in orthopedic trauma, it's very much evolved over the years more and more to avoid doing things in the middle of the night unless it's absolutely necessary. Whereas when I was in training, you work through the night all the time. That's why you were so sleep deprived. Because that you... was the cool thing about it, like Batman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Bat- you, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Did you do that because they walked through the door as an emergency patient, or it was just suddenly, oh, let's do a total hip. It's two thirty in the morning. Let's call them no, in. No, these were because they walked through the door as emergency cases. But the other issue is that some of these you could have said, well, wait, why don't we just stabilize them instead of doing it two in the morning? Do it at eight o'clock tomorrow morning. But a lot of times you said, well, we don't have time because there's already somebody scheduled for 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. But that being said, um, there have been more and more efforts, and they've been largely successful to say only do stuff after hours that is truly necessary. Because it's been shown that patients do better if you don't drag everyone out of bed and drag them into the hospital in the middle of the night and work on them then and put them off. It's, it, it works better to change your, the way you're staffing your personnel to say, well, you know, tomorrow at 7 we get rolling, but tonight – you know, if it's not really necessary to do it now, if it's not utterly emergent, don't. And you share, call in today's world, you describe it as sharing it. So all the orthopedists in Everett, for example, share call at, at certain hospitals? Yeah, the system's very complicated in terms of who covers what, when, and all that. And it's subject to constant discussion and negotiation. But that's essentially correct is we split call. All the different surgeons have a certain number of call days that are their responsibility and and that is that just part of the surgeon's etiquette, or it, it just goes without saying that if you're going to be a surgeon, you're taking call? The answer is, at this point, these things are probably written into medical staff bylaws at every institution, but it's still what we do. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've never, I've never looked at those rules. I don't know what the rules are because I'm a surgeon. I take call. And I bet if I read the rules, I'd say, oh, this is what I would have expected. But, you know, I know the rules are there now, but... Like most people in the medical staff, I probably haven't even read that because my attitude is I have certain call responsibilities, and that's what I do. And when you're um, kind of after medical school and you're trying to choose or pick a residency, I mean, during medical school, did you go into medical school basically going, I want to go into orthopedist no. or orthopedics? What did you want to do when you first went? I didn't know. What I wanted to do was find a career that I thought would be fun and exciting. Yeah, and you did, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Did you yeah. always know you wanted to be a doctor? No, I wasn't even pre-med in, as an undergrad. Ah. Huh. So, yeah, I actually got out and goofed around for a couple of years and said, well, I need to <laughs> brush up my resume and try to get into medical school. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But you were, you were, I mean, if I remember right, you were around medicine. I mean, you're. My parents were both physicians. So when I told them I wanted to go to medical school, it was like this long, suppressed, you know, sigh of relief. Yeah. yeah. Like, what, what the heck else is he going to do? You yeah. Know? But you're being humble. I think if I remember reading an article, I mean, your mom was ahead of her time. She was a pioneer. She oh, was absolutely, a yeah. very early, early female uh, family medicine She was the first uh, female physician at the Ever Clinic. With kids, raising a family. Yeah. That's that's incredible. That is incredible. I mean, I mean, because that's a challenge for a lot of female physicians. It's 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 a career family yeah. and it's a juggle. Your mom did it when no one else did it. Yeah, if she hadn't had kids, she would have been a surgeon. She's got the temperament for it. Other, okay. <laughs> other brothers and sisters you have? Are they? No, doctors? I'm the only one who went into medicine. Huh. Wow. And, and and everyone to join as we have little time. It's kind of like the Avengers, right? I mean, there's like everybody does a different thing, right? Yeah, we have uh, we cover it all, and we have subspecialists pretty much from head to toe. There's, you know, I can't think off the top of my right. head of something that we don't do. And but there's a grown, back guy. There's a there's yeah, it's a grown. there's it's a foot guy. There's a hand it's... guy. There's a spine guy. Yeah. There's a knee guy. I have a. I think I have your logo on my fake knee that's in my oh, leg right his now. His brand. Yeah. His brand. Yeah. It says JM on it. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Yeah. So, yeah it says Everett Bone and Your joint. practice has really evolved at EBJ because I think if you go back, you know, 10, 15 years, I mean, there was four. Uh, yeah, position. we've gr- we've grown a lot. and um, How many are there now? Well, there are eight partners and uh, one who's not a partner yet, but I expect will be. That's gross. He has to learn the secret handshake and stuff. You guys get together and have little breakfast meetings occasionally, don't you? Oh, we you? meet every week. Yeah, they let us come. Remember we got to hang out that yeah, one time? Yeah, that's right. That's right. We it was cool. Special guest. Yeah, it special was awesome. Guest. 
Well, uh, we're out of time. That was fun. I, I really yeah. enjoyed that. that well, was, yeah, uh, come back and talk shoulders yeah, next time. Yeah, we'll talk time. shoulders oh, I, I'm next available. time. I'm <laughs> available. Everett, com is uh, how you can uh, be part of the club and go there and uh, and uh, see how he works. It's probably better under anesthesia. Trust me, it's better under anesthesia and drugs. We'll take you. your word for yeah, it. Well, yeah, trust me on that. Thanks a lot for coming on with us. You're welcome.